Hello, my name is Hwan San Sanim, and I am a Sun or Korean Zen Buddhist monastic, and I am the disciple of Sun Master Songdam. Thank you for attending. Sun Master Songdam is the most respected Buddhist master in Korea. I have been his disciple for over 20 years and his personal attendant for the past 10 years. Last year, Sun Master Songdam asked me to share the spiritual teachings of Korean Buddhism with an international audience. Uh, it seems that he was worried that the Sun meditation teachings these days are being lost among the latest health and lifestyle fads and trends. It seems that meditation in general, and even sun meditation in particular, are being presented strictly as a way to gain so-called healing or well-being or stress relief. Now, sun meditation does provide those benefits, but the original purpose of sun meditation has always been and must always be enlightenment. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, rather than try to get you to agree with me and persuade you to join my religion or something like that, I thought that today, instead, I might share with you the story of how I became a Sinim or a Korean Buddhist monk. Now, I was born and raised in the United States, New York to be exact. My parents were born and raised in Korea and they went to the United States as university students and chose to continue to live there. They met each other there, they got married there, and they raised their family there. Now, like most people of Asian descent, I was raised to study hard and go to a good college. And seeing my parents uh, struggle in what for them was a foreign cultural environment, I thought that the, la the least thing I could do for them was to study hard and go to a good college. And luckily, in time, uh, both my brother and I were able to go to well-known universities. And then it seemed like the whole world had opened up for my family. I knew that with my college degree, I could get a good job, make money more easily than my parents had, uh, meet a good person, get married, have children, buy a big house, the whole deal. It seemed like my family had attained the so-called American dream at last. But that was just my outer life. My inner life was something quite different. For as long as I can remember, I've been plagued by questions about life. Why are we born? What are we here to do or become? What happens when we die? Are we really just flesh and blood? Or is there really something more to us than that? Why does the world exist? What is its purpose? I was haunted by these issues, and so in college, I chose to major in religious studies, and I ended up studying Zen Buddhism. In my junior year, uh, I wanted to meet a real Zen master, so I began to ask around the Korean American Buddhist community. And the name that kept coming back to me was Songdam Sinim, Sun Master Songdam. So I asked, well, you know, what's so great about him? And the answer I got was, he is a true enlightened master, a living bodhisattva. In order to attain enlightenment, he undertook a vow of silence for 10 years. 10 years. I was deeply impressed and intrigued by that. I thought, what could possibly be worth shutting your mouth for 10 years? And after having done all that, what could he have to say that was worth breaking that hard-earned silence? So I decided I wanted to meet him. And after graduation, I made the money to buy a plane ticket and I flew over to Korea. And I arrived at Yonghwa Sa Buddhist Monastery, now my home temple in Incheon, in the middle of winter. And, and in that moment, what I thought when I saw him, the first thing that I thought was, I don't believe this. This guy is enlightened. There really is such a thing as enlightenment. Now, I could talk about Sun Master Songdam for the rest of the day, and I wouldn't be able to convey what it is about him 
that made me think and feel in that way. This happened 25 years ago, and my perception of him hasn't changed at all. Even now, as his attendant, when I meet him, every time I meet him, something in me still catches its breath, and I think, this guy is enlightened. This guy is enlightened. Uh, over the years, my respect for and belief in his attainment have only grown. Now, I do know how this sounds. It's not good form for a disciple to overly praise or brag about his master. And all I can say is that these things really do happen. Uh, the most amazing people really do live in this world. On that day, Sun Master Songdam, the day that I met him, Sun Master Songdam said to me, given your life circumstances, you could get a good job, get married, make a lot of money, and everyone would call you a success. But in your own heart, you will always feel alienated and alone and empty. On the other hand, you could cut your hair, become a sinim, learn how to meditate, and go out and get the answer to your questions for yourself. Now, you have to remember that I was 22 years old at the time, and I thought, I'm still young, and you only get to be young once, <laughs> and this guy wants me to shave my head and become a monk and come live with him in Korea. You know, so I, I told him, you know, I'd think about it, and, and I went back to the United States. And once I was back in, in the United States, in New York, all I wanted to do was get back to my old life. Um, I just wanted to lose myself in the glamour and thrills of the city. But I, I couldn't forget what I had seen. Uh, I kept thinking, but he had the courage of his convictions. He did what he believed in. He lived up to his beliefs. And so over time, I found that all of my books and my life plans and all the fun that I was supposed to be having, all of that lost its flavor for me. And I realized that, that I really did need the answers to those questions. Without those answers, I would always feel a void, a kind of emptiness inside. And I knew that that's also what I would see in the world around me, just a void and an emptiness. So I, I chose to return to Sun Master Songdam, and that's actually what my name means. My name is Hwansan, and Hwansan means return to the mountain. And in a sense, that's what I've been trying to do ever since. Now, an interesting anecdote, maybe. But what really, what can enlightenment really do for us in the lives that we lead? What can enlightenment do for us who live here in the 21st century? In order to, an in order to understand the answer to that question, we first need a working definition of what enlightenment is. Now, traditionally, enlightenment is said to be inexpressible in language and unknowable to the unenlightened mind. Uh, but for practical purposes, the Sun Masters of the past have taught that enlightenment can be provisionally understood as a direct spiritual awakening to one's own nature, to one's true self. Sun Master Songdam himself tells us that you become enlightened to the source of your existence, which as it turns out, is also the source of all things, the universe itself. So again, 
why would ordinary people like ourselves need such a cosmic spiritual awakening? Uh, why can't we be happy and fulfilled without enlightenment? Why isn't it enough just to try to enjoy life and be grateful for what we have and try to be a good person? The answer, according to the ancient sun masters, is that without direct spiritual awakening, no matter how much you think you may believe in things like spirituality and enlightenment, the Buddha, your soul, the true self, whatever you want to call it, in your actual day-to-day -day life, what you truly experience as yourself are your thoughts, your emotions, and your physical sensations. Since birth, this is all that we have ever known of ourselves. And without sun meditation or some other form of authentic spiritual practice, this is all we can ever know of our own existence. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our physical sensations. Now all these things are rooted in the body. And as long as we think that we are strictly our bodies, then we must live in the constant awareness and fear that our bodies, meaning us, must eventually die. And we don't even know when this is going to happen. We could die next year. We could also die next month. We could die tomorrow. We could even die tonight. This is why the ancient sun masters have always said, life and death hang in the balance of every breath we take. It's only enlightenment that can free us from this constant underlying anxiety, this dread of the unknown. What happens when I die? What if anything happens afterward? Now, enlightenment, even so, enlightenment is more than just the removal of our fear of our own mortality. The Sun Masters tell us that enlightenment is also eternal happiness. Uh, direct insight into the nature of reality, the actualization of our unlimited ability to love without fear or doubt or condition, and the realization of hidden, literally unimaginable potentialities of our bodies, our minds, and even beyond. Why is it crazy or unreasonable or a waste of time to consider that being human might be much more than we assume. Why are we so eager to place limitations on ourselves? Where is our spirit of exploration, creativity, experimentation, and progress? Sun meditation is not about this or that religious institution. Sun meditation is about living, learning how to live at our full potential. So then, how do you meditate? Now, because of the time constraints of this program, uh, today I will not be able to share with you the full technique of formal sun meditation practice. Instead, I thought that I might introduce you uh, to a meditative exercise called breath counting meditation. Breath counting meditation is traditionally used in sun, med in sun Buddhism for beginning meditators to develop the mental and physical clarity, focus, and stability necessary for actual sun meditation practice. So I think that that's also a good place for us modern day practitioners to begin. Now, uh, what we'll do is we'll take a break, and when we come back, uh, we will begin to learn how to meditate together. Hello again. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to learn a meditative exercise called breath counting meditation together. Once again, this form of meditation practice is designed to enhance our mental and physical clarity, focus, and stability. So uh, the first element of breath counting meditation is posture. This is where everything begins. So for you viewers at home, what you would like to do now, what you want to do now is prepare a meditation mat 
And if you don't own a meditation mat, what you can do is take a blanket, fold it up into a square, and sit on that. And, uh, and then we can proceed together. So in, seated in breath counting meditation, we're going to be assuming a seated meditation posture. And what you want to do is you want to take the heel of one foot, bring it in like this, and then place your other foot on the opposing lap, like this. Now, for, uh, for most modern people, this is a traditional way of sitting in Asia, but nowadays for most, most modern people, both Asian and Western, this can be uncomfortable. So if you can't get your foot up all the way up on your lap like this, it's okay to just put it on your calf. And if this is difficult, it's okay to just put it down in front of your foot like this. So do what, do what feels right for your body. Uh, this isn't an exercise in physical endurance. So you want to have your feet like that. Then you take your two hands, you put them on the floor, you raise your butt slightly, and then sit back down again. That's great. That's great. OK, now you take your right hand. You take the edge of your right hand, you place it against your belly, and just let it rest. You do not want to be holding your right hand up like this, because that puts stress in your shoulder and your neck. You just want it to let it rest, like this, right? Then you take your left hand, and you just place it right on top of your right hand, OK? And then you let your two thumb tip, your, the tips of your thumbs meet to create a nice, elegant rainbow arc with your two thumbs. Great. Now, you want your back to be straight. Now, for your shoulders, raise your shoulders to your ears like this, then roll, and then drop. Now, take your chin and tuck it in slightly. When you tuck in your chin, what will happen is the crown of your head will rise slightly to the ceiling to create a straighter and longer line from the tip of your, from the crown of your head back down to your tailbone. This will have your spine uh, lengthened to its maximum, to its maximum length. Now then you want to take the tip of your tongue and rest it lightly against the roof of your mouth, just very lightly behind the upper row of teeth. And for your eyes now, you want to be looking straight forward, as in your normal waking hours. But because your chin is tucked in slightly, your gaze will naturally fall on the floor about 3 meters or 10 feet in front of you. So you're going to be looking at the floor in front of you, but you don't want to be staring at a specific object or a, a pattern in the floor or some spot. You're not trying to stare at anything. You want what's called, these days, a soft gaze. You just want your field of vision to present itself to you. Okay? So you're going to be looking forward with a kind of global uh, visual focus. And that, that is the basic seated meditation posture. Now what you want to do in this posture first is explore your body. Start with your face, your neck, your shoulders, and Find any areas of tension and just release. Okay, now, these days, we tend to hold a lot of tension in our face, our neck, our shoulders. So you just want to relax. At, in the end, you just want to be holding your body upright with the minimal level of muscular tension in your body. You just want to be using the, only the muscles that you need to hold yourself upright. And the rest of yourself should just feel very light and settled and relaxed very pliant. Now once we've achieved correct meditation posture, the next thing that we need to uh, direct our attention to is our breathing. Now in meditation, as Sun Master Sungdam teaches it, before uh, engaging formal meditative breathing, which we'll get to in a moment, we begin with what's called preparation breathing. So that's what I'm going to teach you now. Now holding the, the meditation posture, in preparation breathing, what we do is we inhale very, very deeply, a huge inhalation through the nose, and completely fill our upper chest. And when your chest can no longer be filled, can, can, there's no more air that can go in, then you hold it at maximum expansion until it feels uncomfortable. Then 
Finally, you release, you exhale out through your mouth, and you try to exhale every ounce of air in your lungs. Okay? And we, we do, we're going to do that three times. So why don't we try that together? So we inhale. Hold. And then exhale. Inhale, hold, then exhale. Preparation breathing produces a number of beneficial effects. First of all, obviously, it clears out all the stale air in your lungs and fills your body up with fresh air. Secondly, because we're holding our breath, to a point of minor stress, we've kind of surprised our body, our, our mental and physical faculties. So our mind and our body in response try, kind of hit the reset button, try to go back to optimal equilibrium. So we're kind of prodding it to find, prodding both our mental and physical systems to finding their center, to reorient, to readjust, to refresh itself. Finally, by focusing our thought completely on the simple act of breathing, we have naturally redirected our attention from whatever it is we were thinking about or imagining or, or whatever kind of association that we may have been floating in back to the present situation, back to where we are here and now. Simply by focusing our attention on our breathing, we've come back to the present moment and given, us our, given ourselves a new start, a small new start. And then from here, we can begin the formal uh, meditative breathing technique, which uh, in English is often called abdominal breathing because it feels like you're breathing from your lower belly. So now I'll explain how we do abdominal breathing. Now in, in abdominal breathing, we're only going to be breathing through the nose. All right? So you inhale through the nose, and as you inhale, you push out your lower belly very slightly and lightly, as if the air is going down into your lower belly. Okay? And when your lower belly feels about 80% full, comfortably full, you hold. And you pause for one, two, three seconds. Then after the pause, you release your lower belly, allow it to subside, allow it to draw back in, and as you do that, you exhale long and slow through your nose. Okay? Now your exhalation should be somewhat longer than your inhalation. Uh, uh, the, the count, the ratio that some Master Songdam gives in his Dharma, in his Dharma speeches is uh, roughly three seconds for inhalation, three seconds for pause, and then four seconds for exhalation. But the thing is, everyone has their own unique breathing pattern. So you don't have to force yourself to fit that ratio. That, but you should realize that the inhalation and the pause are roughly the same length, and the exhalation is a little bit longer. The most important thing in this form of meditative breathing, in this abdominal breathing, is that uh, it feel natural and soothing and gentle, okay? So why don't we try this together, all right? We're gonna try abdominal breathing together. So we inhale through the nose and just slightly push out our lower belly. And then hold. And then exhale through the nose. Now what you can do is you can imagine that there is a small balloon in the pit of your stomach. And when you inhale, your air goes all the way down into that balloon and makes it swell. And then you hold. So the balloon is just holding in its swollen state. And then when you exhale, you're simply releasing the air from the balloon so your lower belly sinks down again and the air comes rushing out your nose. Uh, scientists have studied this form of breathing and found that it tends to maximize the volume of air that you draw into your lungs 
and the volume of air that you expel from your lungs during exhalation. So literally, this, this form of breathing has a refreshing and cleansing, detoxifying effect on our bodies. We're using the most basic function of our bodies that we think uh, we have to do for our survival and instead turning it into an asset creating function where it becomes something that we can use to detoxify ourselves and rejuvenate ourselves and, and clarify our minds. The traditional account which, uh, you know, in, in Asian spiritual traditions doesn't have a scientific basis, but I feel that it's something that we should not ignore anyway. So I'll, I'll give you the traditional interpretation of why this breathing is good. According to uh, both ancient Indian and Chinese spiritual traditions, uh, we have located about, let's say, an inch and a half or say three to four centimeters below our belly button and in the physical center of our bodies, a kind of energy center an energy field. Now in Chinese, this is called Dan Tian, and in the Korean, pronunci in the Korean pronunciation, that's Tan Chan. Okay, so in, in, according to this perspective and tradition, each time we breathe in, we're not just breathing in uh, the air, we're drawing in this kind of primal vital energy of the universe, which uh, I think many people now are familiar with. The Chinese pronunciation of that energy is qi. Uh, in Korean, it's qi. And then the Indian equivalent is said to be prana. But there's this kind of invisible, undetectable energy that, that saturates and permeates all things. And what we do when we engage this abdominal breathing is we draw it into our bodies and store it in, our energy, in, in this energy field, this dan tian that's located in our lower abdomen. So, whether you choose to literally believe that or not, that traditional interpretation is helpful uh, in, in how we uh, execute this form of breathing. When we, what I mean by that is when we breathe in, imagine that you're drawing in this kind of vital energy of the universe. And then when you're holding it, imagine that it's saturating you. And then, and then when you exhale, you're just exhaling what you don't need, okay? So once again, why don't we try it like that? Now you want your breathing to be nice and slow and even, but not to the point of stress, not to the point of physical stress. Okay, so once again, breathe in. Hold. Then breathe out. Now as we engage this breathing system, and I hope you viewers at home are following along. As we engage this breathing system, um, in the middle of the breath, pay attention to how your body feels and, and the state of your consciousness. Do you feel your body being a little bit energized? And then our, and then our breathing becomes even slower. Our breath becomes longer. And when our breathing, each inhalation and exhalation become longer, our minds calm down and become even more clear, which has an even more relaxing, vitalizing effect on our body, which in turn makes us breathe even longer, deeper, more subtle uh, breaths as we breathe. So we find ourselves, without even realizing, through the simple act of breathing, going deeper and deeper and deeper into the depths of both our minds and our bodies. <clears throat> so this is the first step in, in experiencing what meditation has to give. So, so far we've covered meditation and, and uh, a posture and breathing. And now we come to the third element, the breath counting part. Okay? So what you do for the breath counting part is, we're, we're still in a, an abdominal breathing. You breathe in, hold, and then you breathe out. And just as your exhalation ends, just as it trails off, you count in your mind, one, then you breathe in again, hold, and then breathe out, then you count two, then you breathe in, hold, then breathe out, three. Now you keep counting like this, 
and you go all the way up to 10. And then once you get to 10, you don't go forward to 11, you turn around and go back down to nine. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then once you get back down to one again, you start going right back up again, two, three, four, up to 10. So you're gonna be counting your breaths one to 10, 10 to one, back and forth. And, and we do this breathing meditation as a kind of game. And the rule of the game is this. If in the course of counting your breaths, you even for a moment hesitate, your, your mind kind of drifts and you go, oh, was that three, was that four? Then the rule of the game is you have to go all the way back down to one again and start all over again, okay? So what you want to be doing, the performative aspect of this meditative exercise is you wanna be trying to complete as many cycles of one to 10 and 10 back down to one again as you can. And the degree of your success reflects to you the relative clarity, stability, and unity of your mind at that moment. There are days when our minds are scattered, when we're hung up on some emotions, and you may find yourself going one, two, one, two, one, two. That, that's fine. That just tells you where your mind is. But if you keep doing the breathing, you'll find that you can escape this kind of trap that your mind or your body may be stuck in at that moment. If you find that you can sit down at any moment and, and successfully count a cycle of breaths, one to 10, 10 to one, then you will find that you have made that much more progress in cultivating your own innate mental powers. And then when you get to the point where you can go one to 10 and 10 back down to one again, anytime you choose, then the next thing you do is go up to 20. You count all the way up to 20, then come back down all the way down to one again. And you keep doing that until you master that. And then you keep going and going and going in that manner. Now I wanna take a moment to highlight um, a kind of subtle aspect that's, uh, that this breath, uh, this breath counting meditation uh, draws out. And that is that this breath counting meditation reflects uh, the difference in the traditional Asian spiritual notion of concentration as opposed to the current modern one. Now the very word concentration means clustering into the center and it seems to imply a kind of muscular tension, a focusing, a kind of forcing things out of, you know, out of everything else, out of your field of attention, just focusing on the center. You know, there's a, a, a kind of uh, uh, input of power and tension and force. And that's what we think of as, as concentration. And you can often see it in people in their furrowed brows or in their bunched shoulders or just in this kind of uh, these hard physical postures that, that often accompany uh, our efforts to concentrate. But the Asian uh, spiritual notion, at least traditionally, is something quite different. And the word for concentration uh, reflects the difference in this interpretation. The word in India is samadhi. And the original, that, that word has become known in popular culture. But the original meaning of samadhi is something very simple. It simply means to settle down, like waves on the surface of a lake settling down, like the uh, particles of mud in a body of water settling down until the water becomes clear again. It is a withdrawal of force, a withdrawal of tension. And the metaphor is that our mind is like a body of water and once all the waves are, are settled down, it becomes clear, it becomes like a lens and then you can see what's at the bottom without any effort. When your mind becomes still and clear and centered, then wherever you direct your mind at, you will see that thing clearly without interruption from stray thoughts or physical sensations or emotions or whatever. Concentration, is a state of inner peace and clarity that we can maintain for very long periods of time with minimal use of energy. So this is, very, this is something very different. It does not rely on stress or adrenaline. It's actually very helpful and healthy for our bodies and even our psychological well-being. So this is something to bear in, to bear in mind. And, and what the breath counting meditation shows us, each time you increase the count, each time you feel 
that you're that that it's easier to to count all the way up to 10 or 20 or whatever your target number is and come back down you have increased the inner, your inner stillness and your inner transparency so and your mind has become more powerful even though you're not expending more energy and with that mind whatever you point it at that thing is going to show itself in very clear detail so if you take a mind like that that is transparently clear and centered and still and stable and point it at a problem, that problem will, will reveal itself to you objectively. You will see it as it is and you will see the way out or the resolution. If you look at a person, you will see that person as he or she is, hopefully, and without bias and without the distorting effects of, of emotional response, whether it be positive or negative. And of course in meditation, what we do in sun meditation, what we, what we will eventually do is take that powerfully magnified and clarified mind and point it back at ourselves to see what we really are. Okay, so that's the basic theory behind why this breath counting meditation works. Now, what I would like to do now is uh, why don't we try it out for a few minutes? Okay, initiate the abdominal breathing. And then begin counting and, and I will swing by. Now, in cases like this where you're, you don't have the flexibility yet, what you want to do is you want to increase the height of the mat behind you. And eventually you do want your hands to come in like that, you know, and then just relax your shoulders. Great. And then tuck in your chin slightly. And that's excellent. Yeah. Okay. Now the thing with, um, with increasing the height of the mats is this. The higher you increase the mat, the easier it is on your back, but the more stress uh, goes down into your knees. The lower the mat, the more stress on your back, but the easier it is on your knees. So you need to adjust the height of this back cushion uh, to your particular metabolism. So if you have a bad back, you want it high. If you had bad knees, you want it low. Okay? Great. Great. So. That's great. Okay, why don't we try a little bit of breath counting meditation live, so to speak. Uh, for We will meditate for the time it takes us to complete a cycle of 10 breaths, uh, 1 to 10, and then back down to 1 again. So that would be roughly 20 breaths. Okay, now in Korean Buddhism, when you initiate a session of meditation, it's done by... Uh, using this ritual instrument, which is in Korean is called a chukbi, and which I call in English a bamboo clapper. So when I strike this three times, it means that the, uh, the meditation session has begun. And then at the end, when I strike it three times again, it means that the meditation session has ended. Okay? All right then. Just hang in there a little more, all of us. <laughs> Great. Okay then. So... Assume your, your meditation posture, initiate the breathing, begin breath counting, and with three strikes of the bamboo clapper, we will begin a meditation session.
Okay. Bow together. And rub your palms together. And when your palms get hot, just cup them lightly over your eyes and then your face, and you will have a nice massaging effect. And just as a kind of footnote, what I'd like to share is that Sun Master Song Dam says that if you can get to the point where you can count your breaths from one to a hundred, and then a hundred back down to one again, without making any mistakes at any time you please, you will have uh, cultivated a level of inner mental power, focus, clarity, and stability that is so potent you'll be able to achieve anything that you put your mind to. So that's something that we need to confirm through our own experience. Okay, so that's it for, for today in terms of the time that we have. And what I would like to do, uh, if, if that's okay with all of you, is to finish uh, in meditation. So what we can do is uh, meditate and practice what we've learned, to, what we've learned here together. Okay, so uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you. And uh, in closing, I will uh, say the traditional Korean Buddhist greeting, which is, may we all attain the Buddha. Okay, once again, for our closing meditation, assume the meditation posture. <clears throat> 